In every video I make sure to say that this is a YouTube channel about role-playing games. But what is a role-playing game really? Everyone has their own ideas and frames of reference when it comes to role-playing games and what that term means to them. There are tabletop role-playing games, live-action role-playing games, massively multiplayer online role-playing games. All of these are role-playing games, but they are also very different types of role-playing games. This channel focuses on the tabletop aspect of role-playing and that's primarily what this video will be about. This is a video aimed at newcomers to the hobby who are interested in role-playing games but aren't really sure what it's really about. I'll be going through the basics of what tabletop role-playing can be, what misconceptions there are and what to expect or not to expect from an average session. I'm also going to briefly talk about the history of role-playing to give some extra context to what led up to where we are today. This video will not go into detail about the individual systems, though some will be mentioned in passing. In general terms, a role-playing game is a game in which players assume the roles of characters within a fictional setting. These players act out the roles of these characters within a narrative, and there's typically a formal system of rules and guidelines that dictate the outcome of the character's actions. The exact nature of these guidelines are determined by the type of role-playing game it is. A tabletop role-playing game is a game of interactive and collaborative storytelling conducted in a small social gathering, usually by a group of friends around the table, often with snacks and drinks and the accessories you need for the actual game you're playing. These games tend to follow a predetermined rule set that varies from game to game. Traditionally, one participant takes on the role of Game Master or GM, though different games use different terms to describe this role. The GM then describes fictional scenes for the participants who determine how the characters they portray interact with that scene. Each player controls a single character, these are the protagonists of the story, while the GM controls every other character in the game. These are typically called non-player characters or NPCs, though some modern games have started to move away from this term because in essence a GM is also a player of sorts. Uh, the new Vampire the Masquerade game, for example, has coined the phrase SPC from Storyteller played character because uh, Storyteller is their, their definition of a GM. The player's characters have traits derived from how the game's narrative interacts with its rule set. It's the uh, sophisticated rules that, um, uh, that make this game stand apart from improvisational theatre or children's games on make-believe. These rules determine um, consistency and structure in the experience as well as uncertainty in the outcome. In a traditional tabletop role-playing game, levels of uncertainty are added and tested both to help guide the narrative but also to add a chance of risk and reward. Whereas a children's game or make-believe can create arguments between, uh, between the participants, perhaps one child claims to have won something over another and the other one disagrees, Tabletop games often use dice to give meaning to contests, as well as to generate random outcomes when necessary. There are diceless games as well, and uh, these may work differently from game to game. Some rely on player agreement, but uh, similar to children's games of more competitive make-believe, arguments may arise without a, a guideline for how to resolve outcomes. There are games that incorporate minigames or other games as a tool for resolution. One, one such game is uh, Dread, which uses a Jenga tower in order to resolve outcomes. The more fragile the tower becomes, the more fragile your psyche is, represented by the character's Dread. Should it fall, your psyche crumbles and you're dead. Okay. Huh? Okay. okay. You controlling my okay. breathing? <laughs> you're, you're, you managed to. Oh gosh. Uh -huh. Oh gosh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so you can see that there's an exit. Yeah. Right? And it is clearly illuminated in the full moon. Mm -hmm. And it is enough for you to know that, okay, we can. We, we can, can get, get out if we, we have to. Get, before I started working more seriously on Machineborn, I was theory crafting a card-based game system called Tail Deck. There are other card game systems out there, so I'm not sure if I'll ever get back to Tail Deck in the future, but maybe one day. The first commercial available tabletop role-playing game was Dungeons & Dragons D&D, uh, first created by Dave Arnston and Gary Gygax back in 1974. This was an effort to combine inspirational fantasy literature with the popular wargaming hobby. 
It wasn't as much made to be a role-playing game as it was a complicated combat simulation game. People took this game and turned it into a role-playing game. D&D was first published under Gary Gygax's company TSR, and since it was a niche product, it wasn't expected to sell too many copies. However, this game gave rise to the tabletop role-playing game industry, and it's still the most popular tabletop role-playing game even to this day, several decades and editions later. The same year as D&D came out, a less talked about role-playing game called Empire of the Petaled Throne came out. While this wouldn't rise to the same level of fame as D&D did, this game helped to inspire the direction of role-playing games going forward as well, since it inspired Gary Gygax enough to purchase the rights to it and publish it under his own company the following year. What this game had that D&D would incorporate later was rules for critical successes, that extra meaning you give to rolling 20 on a die, the vital strike that deals more damage. Countless games would come out after D&D, most of them forgotten, but some standing out from the rest. Call of Cthulhu came out in 1981, and Paranoia in 1984, Cyberpunk in 1988, and Vampire the Masquerade in 1991. These games explored new genres and moved away from the wargaming roots towards a more narrative approach. Vampire, for example, emphasized storytelling more than combat simulations, and this widening of the tabletop role-playing hobby helped it reach a broader audience as well. There were games for everyone. Now, the 1980s was an interesting decade for tabletop role-playing games. This was during the so-called Satanic Panic, where D&D was accused of causing negative spiritual and psychological effects on children. I'm not going to talk too much about this in this video, but it's a very interesting time in the history of tabletop role-playing games, and I could make a separate video about it at some point. Though preachers scared parents into taking their children's games away, academic research sense have proven that there are no such negative effects to D&D or other tabletop role-playing games. I do not think that many parents are aware of what's inside the game. In fact, in my presentation I show many pictures from the inside of the books just to show the images of this game. I yes. mean, the gruesomeness of this game and the occult link to it. Well, I know that when uh, I did my message, and this has happened, I have letter after letter where people took the pieces. Now, there's sixes involved in the pieces of the game, but they yes. take the pieces of the game, they would throw them in the incinerator or the fireplace, and screams would come out because there seemed to be some kind of spiritual forces inhabiting those pieces, and children would drop out of life. They didn't want to study anymore. Uh, what, what are the pieces, for instance? Well, this game affects the most intelligent of our children. And the pieces include white witches, wizards, necromancers, the, the clerics, that type of thing. It includes evil wizards. It's a white versus black witchcraft. The good versus evil is white versus black witchcraft. And Anton LaVey, the writer of the Satanist Bible, says there is no such thing as white witchcraft. Well, being a Satan worshiper, he should know. Yeah, he should. In fact, there's a lot of uh, academic research indicating the opposite, that uh, tabletop role-playing games can have a very positive impact on people. I plan to make a video in the future about using role-playing games as a tool for therapy in a professional capacity, because that's something that interests me as a social worker. The tabletop role-playing game hobby did decline in the 2000s, most likely because of competition from video games and collectible card games. This led more publishers to move online. While it's still a fairly niche hobby even to this day, I think the 2010s and now going into the 2020s have been a period where the hobby has been moving mainstream. Much to this, I think, is thanks to Critical Role's success and the popularity in general for live action plays online. D&D is bigger today than it's ever been, and people getting into D&D leads to more people exploring other games than D&D as well, such as Cyberpunk or my own favorite game, Exalted. Tabletop role-playing games are played similar to radio dramas, but the level of acting and immersion varies from group to group and from player to player. A lot of newcomers to the hobby have been introduced to it through live play shows such as Critical Role, but these shows are often focusing on uh, entertaining the audience more than portraying the game as it's generally played around, the, around an average table. There are definitely groups who play the game or try to play the game like that, but uh, it's definitely not the norm. And... Um, it's wrong to expect of it to be the norm. When the shows are performed by professional actors, this further 
skews people's impression of the hobby and what's expected of them as players. My personal preferences is that I prefer when people speak in character, but I don't generally like when people do voices. When I roleplay I want to focus on the theatre of the mind, what you and your players visualize as the story unfolds, but this is different from actual theatre. While I love watching shows such as Critical Role or LA by Night even more so, I don't want to play like that myself, and I don't want a newcomer to the hobby to assume that's the way the game is played. There's been a lot of discussions about gatekeeping within the gaming community, and I want to highlight these, let's call them critical role expectations as a new type of gatekeeping. Tabletop roleplaying should be open and inviting to everyone, even those who aren't comfortable with the levels of uh, performance and immersion that you often see in these shows. I think that everyone can get something enjoyable out of roleplaying, but what these things are vary from people to people. As for how I play the game, well, I can only speak for myself and my own experience. If I'm the GM for a game, I try to prepare a few scenes based on the story goals I want to reach in the session. If my players have already prepared their characters, I add in some details about things I expect from certain characters or things things I want certain characters to have a chance to experience. This could be a few puzzles aimed towards a certain character's skill set, or perhaps a scene where an NPC that has a connection to one of the players may partake. While I try to add as much as I can to cover as many possibilities as I can, my ultimate goal is to let the players guide the action with, uh, with a few nudges by me here and there to try to keep things from derailing too much. I tend to have a few pages of notes of prepared material, but I tend to find myself looking at them hardly ever. Some game monsters can easily prepare entire sessions, while others need to plan out every scene. I consider myself to be somewhere in the middle. I can improvise a scene well, but I'm not too good at improvising key story goals. The GM's role is much more complicated than the player's role, and it's a much more daunting task to take on. But uh, if you're playing with friends who are actually respectful of each other's experience, you'll find that the players will often um, help you along when you stumble. I know that this isn't supposed to be a GM tips video, but I still want to mention that my one main tips for new game masters is to not be afraid of failure. By realizing in the moment that you don't have a contingency in place, you're forced to improvise, and um, even if you nervously stumble through the scene, you'll find that the players don't actually notice this as much as you do yourself. I also think that it's often in scenes like this when uh, the most memorable moments take place, and these are the moments that surprise everyone at the table. Anyway, after I've um, prepared my notes for the session, I invite my players, and... Um, we usually play on weekends when everyone's having off time, and we often meet up for lunch before the game, before heading over to my place or someone else's. We start out quite slowly, more uh, jovial and social, with a lot of casual chatter. We make coffee, hand out some snacks, and ease ourselves from social mode into game mode. Here's where a lot of groups have some different expectations, and uh, it's good to communicate with each other what your own expectations should be. I see roleplaying night as being the same as social night, and I want everyone to have the freedom to speak when they want, take breaks when they want, use their phones when they want, refill their drinks when they want, and even drink what they want. As long as someone isn't disrupting the game, I don't really mind if people drink alcohol or briefly want to mention something fun that happened the other day. A game session doesn't have to be formal, it has to be fun. And sometimes just being social with friends is what's fun. However, when I feel that someone is interrupting an active and engaging scene, or when I feel that uh, someone is getting annoyed by being interrupted as they are actually trying to focus on playing the game, then I'll speak up and ask everyone to focus. I don't want the social chatter to take up more time than the actual game itself. I think a respectful player should try to read the atmosphere in the moment and then decide if them interrupting the game for an anecdote is appropriate in this very moment. I have some triggers at the table and that's when too much time is spent arguing about the rules. If there's something that uh, can't be resolved immediately by taking up the book and just looking up the answer, then 
my opinion is that the GM should make a ruling, the group should play by that ruling, and then the argument about whether or not the ruling was right or wrong waits until after the game session. When it comes to interruptions at the table, I may have made it seem like I'm all for it. Uh, that's not that's not even remotely true. I think there's a difference between interrupting a scene to crack some joke that makes everyone laugh from um, interrupting another player who's engaged in a scene. If you wait for the right moments, the social jabs here and there will usually just make the evening more fun. Some game masters run their games like a prison with strict rules on how to behave, when to take breaks, when to speak up, how to speak up. If that's what you like, go for it, but that's not fun for me. I think the I think there are moments when that's necessary, but too much in either direction takes away from the fun, and I think a happy balance can be found in the middle. When the game is underway, what I expect from my players is nothing, uh, nothing really too demanding other than engagement and interest. They don't even need to know the rules very well. You can easily tell when a player is bored because that's when the phone comes up. I don't tell my players how to play their characters to always speak in character or how to resolve certain situations. I may have opinions about that. I may prefer certain ways of doing things, but every player should get to decide for themselves how to play the game. It's, uh, it's only when a player is disruptive in some way that I step in and uh, what constitutes as being disruptive is something that every player and every group will have to feel out for themselves. But let's talk about actual roleplay. How much roleplay is expected and how much is required. Some players will never be comfortable taking the role of another character, but they still enjoy the game just as much as the, as the player who never leaves their character. The difference is that the player who don't want to play the role can still guide their character's action through the game. Instead of actually speaking and saying, could you show me the way to the inn, they, they are guiding their character's action by stating that I ask someone to show me the inn. They still did the same thing, they drew the same conclusions, but they could still keep themselves separated from the character. Most players will want to do a mixture of both. Sometimes they speak in character, and sometimes they suggest what the character speaks about without actually saying the words. Never never enforce one way or another. Always, always do what you're comfortable doing. A lot of the time players may want to get comfortable speaking in character, but they aren't used to the social environment yet. If that's the case, I found that it's helpful to get them to open up and uh, immerse themselves more by using NPCs to let them practice. If you've got an introverted player in a group of extroverts, that introverted player may want to roleplay just as much as the extroverts do, but they don't really get a chance to, to initiate it. A good GM should be aware of this and take note of this, and help that player initiate roleplay by initiating it for them. For example, by using NPCs to address them personally about certain things, to see how they feel about actually answering questions, for example, in character. And then hopefully this could help them open up and eventually initiate roleplay themselves. I started roleplaying when I was only 8 years old, but there was a time during my high school years when I didn't roleplay at all. And this actually made roleplaying as an adult feel super cringy at first. But uh, that was mainly because I hadn't had a feel yet for the social environment and what attitudes the other players at the table had or would have. As long as people remain engaged and respectful and don't judge their fellow players for how they approach the game, I find that things relax fairly quickly. And if they don't, like I said, don't force it. People are different. The length of a session varies. When I was younger and had more free time, we often played throughout the night. I think the longest session I've ever played without rest was 26 hours. This was when we played the Daughter of Nexus story arc for our Exalted 2nd edition. I've also had a few sessions where we played most of the day, slept for the night and then kept playing as soon as everyone woke up. Nowadays my sessions tend to be between 5 and 8 hours, which is still a pretty long session, but we, us we usually have some break in between and uh, because we don't get together as often as we used to, we try to take advantage of the time we have. And that ultimately leads to longer sessions. 
I don't think a new player should come in expecting sessions that last for that long though. You'll get the feel for what works for your group. I think that between 3 and 5 hours is probably optimal for most groups. Anything less than, uh, than 3 hours, time tends to fly by fast when you roleplay and I personally think that anything less than 3 hours is just too short to really, to really get into things. It leaves you wanting. There is a there is a special feeling to those eight plus hour sessions though, but uh, they may not be healthy, but they they are a lot of fun. One session doesn't have to mean a finished game either. Many groups play campaigns that sometimes last for years, with uh, every session just being a brief progression towards a larger story. My Dawn of the Chosen campaign for Exalted Third Edition started in 2015, and it's still going strong. I've I've had probably more than 10 different players playing different characters, some multiple characters. Though I don't think I've ever had more than 5 players at a time. If you're interested in roleplaying and want to get into the hobby, whatever you do, don't feel intimidated. Start as a player if you can, because then you have a GM who can show you the ropes, and don't hesitate to ask your GM questions. As a player in a roleplaying game, you have the agency over your own character. There are things that are good to know about portraying characters in games, such as matters of consent and metagaming, but those are broad topics that need videos of their own, so I'm not going to go into them right now. For now, just focus on trying to take your first step and get into a game, and remember that roleplaying is a social experience, and it's important that everyone is having fun. If you like this video and want to see more, please like, share, comment and subscribe. I also have a Patreon where you can learn more about my various projects, and you can also find a manuscript for this video right there. I'm going to leave a link in the description below. I only needed to go into my first session as an 8 year old to get hooked by this hobby for life. It's actually impacted my life in a massive way, not just because I'm making videos like this as a hobby on the side, but because I now get to write for roleplaying games professionally. I'm no more an expert on roleplaying games than the roleplayer down the street, but I'm passionate. And if you give this hobby a chance, I think you might get passionate as well. Once again, I hope you enjoyed this video and I promise more of them in the future. Until then... <laughs>